Hi, thank you for taking our time and welcome to API Days New York. Uh, I hope you enjoy your day at this conference. And open APIs in financial services, banking as a service, open finance, indeed are all hot topics connected to the, our world of, of APIs, right? Um, so my name is Rafael Marins. I work in product marketing for financial services vertical and I join my colleague Satya in this presentation. And in this session, we'll cover Red Hat's approach to protect and secure core banking APIs, which is becoming increasingly important uh, to embrace digital ecosystem. So uh, let's, let's start then. So uh, what we'll cover today to, so we're gonna present this workshop and it's divided in two parts. First, an overview of scenarios and challenges of plugging in the external APIs into the core banking that we find in many leading banks that we work with, along with a demonstration of uh, open digital banking platform to provide APIs as product in, in a digital system. And afterwards, my colleague Satyal will introduce how to secure and protect banking APIs, an approach that involves using API gateway pattern together with service mesh in a microservice architecture. So let's start them. And the central positioning of core banking systems makes them one of the most critical components in the overall banking architecture. And any change in, the, in these core systems will have impact through all channels and operations. And historically, completely replacing the core was the only upgrade option making core banking platform upgrade for, for the bank and, and this decision. And, and this is how Gartner defines the core banking. Uh, it's a central, as a central uh, uh, systems that can serve to multiple business functions could be core banking for payments, core banking for, uh, for deposits and, and so on. Uh, but it's, it starts to get more, Spread in, the, in a distributed architecture, and and if efficient financial systems are developed in different forms and level of maturity in countries and and cross border, uh, all making usage of extensive extensive usage of technology. And the largest banks of today have been built over decades using customizations to solutions and countless number of systems from, from acquisitions. So the past and the future uh, from the brick and mortar to digital ecosystems. So some may argue that core banking is always evolving, always modernizing. However, the low level of innovation in market development over the past decades in financial services uh, rings a bell if institutions really seems to be holding back competitiveness. Um, and custom expectations are changing more, de changing and demanding more digital services, right? Uh, this is a trend in market force uh, for the entire banking industry and could ultimately change the value chain for customers, intermediaries, and banks. Uh, so customer and his journeys, experiences are at the center of the digital leadership across all industries. and. Choose, choosing the building blocks of the ecosystem that provides the organization's added value is the cornerstone for this transformation. And to be as responsive as commonly used modern platforms require much more than interactive interface. It requires simplifying the complexity of this core business process and associated customer and account management and, and, and general ledger data system. So, no matter how sleek they seem, application interfaces still rely on the older mainframe logic coded in COBOL language that origins date back in, 90s, in, in, in the 60s uh, for, for the critical information. So, and institutions are aware of the system requiring some level of modernization, but until recently, they have found themselves looking at massive investments of time, effort, and money and historically, his place in core banking season was expensive undertaking that could 
not really demonstrate the return on investment in short, short term. So a full replacement could be a multi-year effort and a significant resource commitment from, from the institution. And there is a considerable operational risk involved due to the transformation complexity and the potential disruption of the day-to-day -day operations. And so there are many other uh, concerns and, and challenges, but also the opportunities in the market and the ecosystems to drive innovation. Uh, and openness will be the defining characters of the technology and culture driving success in, in the core. And these three pictures shows the level of the inter interdependency and modularity of the core banking capabilities in the as is state and possibilities of the future state. And this in this matrix of different line of business in columns, I cross it with supporting organization structure and banking are decomposing and outsourcing some of these business functions and decomposing large and complex monolith systems and traditional system of records into a modular architecture. And that is uh, the, 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 all the shifts and transformations going behind the scenes for the core banking that is important for the external APIs you provide. So the answer for many firms to, is to outsource and streamline this architecture in, in this intermediary model in the center. And they will be looking for to, to streamline this architecture, most vendor provided with significant outsource uh, of back office process and right hates of straight through processing, eliminate most manual tasks. And many banks are beginning to rethink the traditional view of internal development, realizing that fostering in a health partners ecosystems is competitive. It's a competitive necessity. Um, the idea is to streamline the architecture to enable integration of solutions from smart services provider, wherein it's easy to bring on new partners and equally simple to switch them out for another as needs change. Uh, and the back office becomes more of a supply chain of services near, nearing full automation in some parts of them. So achieving this is where banks become more a modular service provider. And when we look through the API lens and the product API pro as products that banking can offer to innovate in digital ecosystems, we start to see uh, our architecture that this is the architecture that that helps you secure your core banking APIs. The entry point to the banking business capabilities are open APIs that could be standard APIs as part of the consumer data sharing framework like open finance partner APIs to accelerate open innovation, providing seamless buying experiences and lifetime journeys via fintechs tech themes and, 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 and sure techs, or even digital channel APIs that connects external customers via bank provided channels, mobile banking, chatbots, uh, cognitive customer services, and so on. And the, key, the key, key components of this architecture are the infrastructure and the development pipeline automation that ensure quality, security, and compliance while continuous delivering microservices into production Two classes of banking modules are deployed in service mesh through the pipeline automation. There is one is uh, the fit for propose the, with the customer journey microservices that delivers the end user experiences through open APIs and the core, the business capabilities microservices, which is the, the composition of the core banking in, in a cloud native architecture. Uh, so the event streaming is a key service that allows you to decouple the core banking legacy systems into a business capability integration layer and protecting and securing the internal core banking APIs means architecting your digital platform with some, some principles. And, and these are the following principles, the trust on the enterprise level identity provider for strong customer authentication and authorization and, and user federation. Uh, it helps to support access control mechanisms 
on external access to open APIs, leveraging open standards for API security like OAuth 2, OpenID Connect, financial grade APIs, and third, uh, integrated with the existing user credential store and, and entitlements. So re relying on a lightweight API gateway controls backhead with uh, a, by advanced API management capabilities and not only authenticate the external access to, our, to your open APIs, but also ensure a role-based access control is extended in the service mesh perimeter to have a, 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 a zero trust network kind of implementation for your, your microservice architecture, allowing to have more granular authorization in your microservices architecture from the client application to your core banking capabilities, the most important aspect of this. And to talk very briefly about the Red Hat Open Bank sand Sandbox solution, uh, it's a toolkit developed by Red Hat to expedite the deployment of the of the, the, the previous architecture I show together with standard APIs. I will show a short demo and in this demo, there is a developer portal to, to navigate through and quickly navigate through the catalog of available open APIs in tech for external consumption um, with a pre registered user. So let me share my, my, my screen here. Yeah, so here, is, here it is. Uh, this is the open banking sandbox by Red Hat. The idea on this, this, this toolkit is to really accelerate uh, non-production usage of the Red Hat toolings. And I have a pre-registered user that I, I use to do a login as an API developer. And by getting access through to the to the developer portal, I'm able to view and navigate through a catalog of APIs that I can use for developer purpose and navigate through the documentation. And these are standards, Open Banking UK standard APIs, open APIs. Uh, so let's pick one, let's say range locators, first one. And this, all this documentation is saved in the back end of the API management platform. Uh, and the provided documentation using the, the API specifications uh, and standards. And look at here, you see examples, the model for the API definition. And I can try out this from the browser. Uh, so let's use this. I copy the user key. This is a this OpenBS sandbox is configured here with a minimal uh, API key kind of authentication, and then later later we're gonna show you an OpenID Connect con uh, kind of uh, authentication and authorization. So let me put the user the API key here, and then we can I can execute and see the results for this API call. So here it is. It uh, would provide the command line for using, making making this API call or even getting the response. You can understand and check the, res the results and use this as part of your application. And this all these services is implemented using Red Hat API lifecycle for developing and mocking APIs and also deploying APIs. I'll show you uh, very quickly. Uh, so alternatively, I can use this command line I have prepared here to make similar call to the branch locator API and get the same results. So both are placing this call to the same. same API 
uh, product in this in my cluster uh, for this API conference, API based conference. And and then I can show you is the Triscale API management back admin portal. This is where you can see uh, all the configured APIs and that I have shown on the, the developer portal, but better also see the analytics of this uh, for this API calls and have all the controls, policy management, uh, configurations of multiple backends for product APIs and so on. Um, and this is how my APIs have been configured. Let me show you branch locator API. Uh, it's configured with cross. It's automatically configured with cores uh, enabled for, for this API and basically using API cast, uh, API gateway. And actually this configuration go this goes to the back end that is my mock api internally running on my cluster this mock api have been is a really a collection of a collection of examples in the let me log in here so it's a collection uh that i i, I prepared on postman postman and then importing into microx and i can run my the, the collection here to the the to save the collection here and and use for my api call so i can see the branch locator is a data collection over here which is providing the the results in the branch that's the same result i got over there but most importantly this this is running as as a container uh in the full cluster, uh, including the API management layer uh, and also the API gateway. So I want to show here is the that we are running in the, the sandbox namespace. We run the tree scale operator. And with tree scale operator, I'm able to deploy all the APIs including the branch locator APIs using custom research definitions. And that makes me easier to integrate into my pipeline and promote the deployment of my, my, my of the APIs uh, using API as a code in, in integrated approach and also my backend. So all these configurations are put in my GitHub repository that I can show you. And this is during the deployment stage uh, in the deployment pipeline, I pick these APIs from the de this developer portal, this GitHub repository and deploy into my cluster. So the custom resource definitions is placed in this folder. And this is where you can really see uh, the branch locator backend and the branch locator product API and you are able to navigate through, see all the definitions, uh, how it's configured with matrix, uh, policies, uh, and so on. Uh, and this is where you can see all the services for the develop portal, the specifications that are loaded as develop, as in the developer portal as the documentation uh, and the mock data are all saved over here. And this is the foundation for uh, the API. So go, going back to the presentation, uh, oh, this is another thing. Uh, this is a collection of, of, of my API. So I, the work I did in Postman, I, I can also place API calls using Postman. It's configured with my API key uh, and getting also the same results uh, as there. And yeah, and that is it. So now we go back to, to the presentation, we continue and, and switch over to, to Satya. So let me stop my sharing.
And I, I ask you, Satya, to present yourself very briefly before I start talking and, 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 and enjoy the rest of the session. Thank you very much, Rafael. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so uh, my name is Satya Jayanti. Along with Rafael, I'm also part of Red Hat. I work in the integration business unit as the API management and integration product marketing manager. Uh, let me share my screen. So uh, just changing topics a little bit from what uh, Rafael talked about. So he kind of showed you uh, what are the aspects of your core banking APIs and how you take care of uh, uh, when you develop your APIs and you know when, how you expose your APIs and doing the mocking and using the sandbox to uh, speed up your development. I want to take it a step further to kind of introduce you to some uh, other paradigms like uh, the use of service mesh, uh, you know, and uh, the, if you're using a microservice architecture, how do you define APIs and microservices and how both of those technologies can work together? So you're all familiar with the whole uh, cloud native approach to modular services, right? So you build a service, uh, uh, you know, and uh, it, it may be made up of uh, one or multiple different microservices uh, to solve a business use case. And, uh, you know, uh, it, it has a, a definite bounded context. And then you deploy it onto a container platform. But you have all of these additional, uh, uh, you know, additional uh, uh, functionalities that you need to think about. Uh, you know, how does it communicate with other services? How how to do uh, data management, testing? How to secure services? For uh, you know, uh, how to do observability across the whole domain? How to do uh, uh, CI/CD and pipelines, automated deployments? Uh, run times uh, and things like that. So this is where your uh, service mesh typically comes in and says, we solve all those problems for you, right? So when you're developing a microservice architecture in a cloud native world, uh, there is a service mesh that uh, delivers you that traffic control, security, resilience, and observability, right? Uh, and the targeted user is your developers or DevOps engineers who are trying to develop the microservices or deploy them onto your container platform. At the same time, you have to also manage the relationship between your uh, API services and the consumers, right? So, uh, so, so these um, uh, services that you have developed using the microservice architecture, when you expose them to your uh, business consumers as APIs, then the whole API framework gets applied over it. You need API contracts, monetization, maybe a developer portal, documentation, some sort of rate limiting, access control policies, and all that. So the targeted users are, again, your API providers and API consumers. So it's very different from what your service mesh is intending to target. So uh, to, to reiterate the point then, API management will try to manage the relationship between your uh, APIs and their consumers. The service mesh is uh, uh, more embedded within uh, your architecture itself and tries to deliver that traffic control, security, resilience, and observability for your cloud native applications deployed into your container platform. So an example of managing uh, APIs for external consumers is the ability to use API products and backends as an example. So you may have multiple API backends that you have developed. Each of these would be uh, you know, developed using microservice architecture. So there may be a single ingress point with each of these uh, backend services. And then you provide an API product layer on top. So instead of uh, exposing a backend to the customer, uh, which you know, which may be your internal URL, your internal path formats, or your internal uh, uh, te technical paradigms, you uh, sort of uh, frame it into a business context, uh, frame it as a business product, uh, package it with uh, different plans, uh, appealing to either uh, different uh, uh, different environments or to different consumers. And so when you use this uh, API management and service mesh then, 
So this is what uh, uh, you uh, try to target, your external facing APIs, uh, which are going to be consumed by your API consumers, uh, or who are typically outside of your enterprise boundary. You try to uh, expose uh, those APIs through an API gateway in, and use an API management platform. And your uh, microservices uh, that belong within your organization, the communication between and across the microservices, you would try to manage them as internal facing microservices and using the uh, service mesh architecture. So then that becomes your. Uh, and uh, a typical what is called a north-south versus an east-west management. So north-south is a traffic that is go coming from north or coming from an external uh, uh, boundary. Uh, and east-west is uh, communication that is happening across your, uh, uh, inter across your organization itself. But then uh, the challenge comes when, uh, if particularly for more complex organizations or for uh, for strictly uh, dividing the domain context, uh, which is bounded uh, from uh, different consumer, different microservice groups. Uh, if you want to introduce uh, a more formal way of uh, dividing, uh, you know, traffic and controlling traffic across these uh, different groups of microservices across domains, then your internal facing APIs in your east-west paradigm would also need to have that kind of uh, uh, ability to be managed as, as, uh, as if they're external consumers and they would be uh, able to be managed uh, as APIs. So we will talk a little bit about how that uh, happens as well. So what distinguishes an interdomain traffic with an intradomain traffic, right? Uh, typically, uh, if there is an hierarchy associated with it, right? So there is usually a, a single ingress point, uh, and, and then that ingress point is calling all of the other uh, services within that group. Uh, and uh, there, there is uh, uh, no formal contract associated with it, but uh, 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 there is a discovery that you need to do and authorization and auth authentication to get into this. So that is a more hierarchical north-south uh, uh, producer consumer pattern. Whereas if you have a one-to-one -one communication between the different uh, microservices, consumers usually part of the same group or within the same uh, cluster that you deployed in, uh, usually uh, the contracts are more implicit and documentation is within the code directly as annotations uh, or you know sharing the same uh, repository this is more a network graph of connected services and so if you look at the security paradigms and apply it to the different uh, uh, capabilities uh, that both these products have you see that uh, for a hierarchical pattern api management is the best uh, pattern to use provides you with the authorization, authentication, and uh, the application layer security that you're looking for. So you're not concerned with network layer or you know the, uh, the security that happens uh, for ingress or you know for uh, protecting a particular uh, service, but uh, in uh, but a way of uh, providing application layer security. You know what? How do? Uh, how does an external consumer try to access uh, my uh, my application? And then for a service mesh, it is more about uh, doing traffic control uh, to the uh, to the service itself, providing Kubernetes ingress destination rules, uh, providing clear whitelisting and blacklisting, which uh, from which uh, clusters uh, you can uh, you can connect to that particular microservice, and providing more of a network layer security, uh, load balancing, and mutual TLS options. So for uh, API management now, uh, with uh, security, there are two, two uh, there are three different uh, ways that you could secure. You could, uh, of course, naked APIs, uh, you know, just expose the backend endpoint without any security. That's, you can consider that's level zero. And that's something that you don't want to use in a real production. Uh, environment it could easily be uh, you know uh, be uh, misused or there is a big security flaw if you use that so uh, the the simplest way of security is to use a single key uh, called an api key this is a single secret that you share with a client so when a client registers they get a single user key and they use that to make requests 
or you use a key pair. Uh, this kind of works like HTTP basic auth uh, with a shared ident uh, uh, with a public identifier and a shared secret or an app ID and app key. Uh, and uh, you know you use that. Uh, the user is responsible for managing their keys, uh, and the provider is responsible for providing the ID. So it uh, kind of uh, is a higher level of security. And then the highest level of security, particularly for enterprise applications is to use OpenID Connect and uh, you know in, in a way to federate uh, your uh, user identity to a, a specified identity provider and then use the identity uh, and uh, you know and a secure token to then uh, validate the user uh, for accessing uh, a particular API. Uh, so that's the authentication mechanism. So beyond authentication is your access control. Okay? So access control uh, is uh, basically questions like, yes, this user is authenticated. So it is a valid user, but does he still have access to this uh, API or a subset of this API, maybe this path or this uh, you know, HTTP request method, right? That's the level of access. And then uh, that, that is access at the application level and then also access at the user level. So is this particular end user allowed to call this API or this subset of API? So merging them both together, then uh, when uh, you have your service mesh kind of managing that uh, traffic uh, networking between the microservices and uh, API management uh, providing access across microservices, we look at a simple use case. So let's look at this particular microservice architecture, which uses service mesh and ingress gateway. Uh, we have taken the book info example, if you are familiar with it. So there are four different microservices uh, with multiple versions deployed. Uh, and uh, you have policies and destination rules for that intra-service communication. And there is an ingress uh, envoy associated to help you with uh, uh, routing the uh, request directly to the product page. When you add a gateway on top of it, uh, right? API gateway on top of it. Typically what happens is it is added ad as an additional reverse proxy. So it's an additional reverse proxy with an additional API management layer with its own uh, application plans and user security keys, et cetera. So now your API consumers uh, will, uh, will use their API keys uh, or, uh, or API authentication to connect to the, uh, uh, to the uh, through the gateway and then the requests uh, at the back end are passed to the ingress envoy and then into your application. So now what you are, what you ends up happening is you have two control planes, the Istio control plane and the API manager control plane and two gateways with the API gateway and the ingress gateway. A cool way is to merge them together, right? So if you, if you could uh, actually bring your API management capabilities inside your service mesh, you don't need that, uh, uh, you know, the additional uh, level of uh, uh, level of management that you need to do uh, in a different uh, gateway. And at the same time, eliminate the need for uh, your rules to be applied uh, in, a, in a different layer. Right, so now you have a single control plane uh, within which uh, both of your uh, uh, rules are applied and a single ingress envoy through which uh, your uh, authentication and authorization and rate limiting that you have defined within your API manager are also applied here. Okay, so let me showcase a demo of that. Okay, so uh, let me get into the demo environment. Okay, so uh, just wanted to showcase uh, what we are uh, showing today. I have an uh, uh, I have a cluster that is uh, OpenShift cluster with three scale uh, Istio service mesh, uh, uh, Kiali, Yeager, and all of the other components deployed. I have my book info application deployed as a set of microservices, and I have got my uh, uh, my uh, Red Hat single sign on, uh, through which I want to showcase uh, uh, Open ID Connect capabilities as well. So let's take the simplest approach first, which is uh, to show you uh, what happens when you make a request directly to the Istio endpoint. Okay, so if I make a direct request to an Istio endpoint, 
I get the response directly, right? So no surprises there. And if I go into my uh, Kiali and uh, look at my uh, graph, should take a while to load up. Yeah, so you could see that, uh, you know, I can now visualize uh, my uh, request coming in from my Istio ingress, going to my product page, and then uh, that in turn is uh, consuming from my details, reviews, and ratings, right? Uh, and uh, I could uh, do that. Now, what I have done, I've shown you the second step, which is uh, to actually add, uh, you know, a layer of uh, API management to it. So the way that I have added the API management layer to it is uh, gone into three scale. And in my three scale product, I've added a book info product, which uses the API gateway. So this will be the external API gateway. So if you see here, what I have done here is the backend is the Istio endpoint, which is the exact same endpoint uh, that we have uh, directly accessed here. But for external consumers, this uh, Istio ingress will be uh, restricted and the ingress will be possible only through the API gateway. Right, so the API gateway itself exposes an endpoint to it and the API gateway is secured using an, a user key, right? So now what happens is if I make a request uh, directly to my uh, API gateway endpoint, I could see that I now get a response back, okay? And what I can do is this is orthogonal because this is actually two different uh, uh, control planes. So in this control plane, I could uh, visualize the traffic that is coming in uh, to and hitting my API management and in this, uh, I could visualize the traffic coming into my uh, service mesh, right? So uh, the observability is now divided between two different gateways. Now what I would uh, do is I would try to merge the two. And the way that uh, we merge the two is uh, we have what is called uh, an Istio adapter and uh, uh, Istio uh, adapter. And with that adapter, what happens is whatever uh, uh, configurations uh, I have defined in three scale uh, for that particular service, they are, uh, they are uh, applied directly in the Istio control plane itself. So let me show you that particular product. So if you go in here and you see the Istio adapter product, uh, and now if you look at the configuration, so the configuration shows that it's a service mesh configuration. So there is a kind of configuration that is available. If I go to the settings here, wherein the deployment says Istio. So uh, you have defined it as Istio and you have used an API key authentication uh, for this particular API product, which means that I'm able to make this uh, uh, request directly to the uh, ingress endpoint and see my API management rules applied, okay? So if I see here, what, uh, what do I get now? Three scale is now providing uh, an authentication, right? And it says you, 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 ha you have authentication, you have not provided the authentication, so you're not authorized to use this particular uh, uh, endpoint, right? So directly into my Istio uh, ingress, uh, I have uh, used my, uh, I have used my, uh, uh, my uh, three scale uh, configurations, right? So here, and uh, now I can see that my response is correct and I'm, I'm getting the response back uh, from my uh, three scale. It gets better. Right now uh, in my graph, I can uh, visualize that, you know, the traffic is coming directly into my product page. And if I go into my Jaeger and do a uh, finding of traces, I could see that my uh, uh, my uh, is Istio um, three scale adapter is also getting involved here, which means that, you know, the traffic uh, across the whole flow between API management to service mesh, I could directly visualize in one place. What I can also do is uh, in here, I could also visualize as a business user, you know, if you could imagine a business user not interested in the observability and traceability, the, the, you know, that's something that the ops will do. As a business user, what I care about is, uh, you know, uh, for my business, what's the traffic coming? And for a business user with the uh, uh, with the three scale, uh, uh, three scale, uh, you know, admin portal, 
they are able to usually uh, visualize and see the analytics of what the products are. And uh, for your business users, it's very convenient because they could come in here, they could set up some sort of an application plan here and uh, you know set up moni my pricing, monitoring, billing, and I could even set up things like uh, you know a usage limit here. Uh, and with the usage limit, what I can do is, uh, uh, you know, I could then try to make the same request multiple times and try it and see that the uh, usage limit has been exceeded, right? So with that, uh, what I'm able to do is I'm configuring things on three scale, but I'm able to uh, control things using the Istio ingress gateway that is uh, uh, that is part of my uh, uh, my uh, Istio control plane. Okay. Uh, one last thing we will try to do is we will try to change this particular uh, API product to use the Open ID Connect. Okay, so I, hopefully I have all set it all up correctly. So the configuration is updated. Let me update the configuration, right? That's promoted. And if I see my application here, it should be able to show me my client ID and secret correctly. So now the configuration has changed from using the user key to using the client ID and secret. Okay, uh, since I'm using uh, Postman for testing, I provided the uh, Postman redirect URL here uh, for uh, for my uh, Open ID Connect uh, authorization code flow. Okay, one last thing I have to do uh, is to be able to actually go in and uh, change the uh, configuration of my uh, uh, my adapter to use this particular configuration. So let me, okay, sorry. I have to be going in here to do this. Yeah, and uh, so now if you see here in my instance, I, I was using a user key uh, for managing my requests. Uh, what I would do now is uh, instead of using the uh, user key, I would use the client ID and the client. Uh, and the app key, which is what you would expect uh, an, uh, uh, a user who is using OpenID Connect to send you. And now we go in here and in Postman, I try to make a request to the same Istio ingress with OAuth2 and uh, using uh, uh, using that particular uh, uh, authorization code flow, right? And I try to use the authorization code flow with my uh, uh, Keycloak user and provider. Now let me check the client ID and client secret because as I have changed this, that must have changed. So I have uh, FB3, uh, it's here. Yeah, I think it's the same. Okay, so let me try to uh, get a new access token. And I sign up as the user. Gets my new token. And if I send the token, I get the response back now. So if you see it in uh, the HTML, I could visualize it. and. So what uh, what I'm doing now is uh, it's doing authorization code flow. It's uh, redirecting to uh, Red Hat single sign-on. Your user is specified in Red Hat single sign-on. So that, that's the user that uh, it's uh, authenticating for. The rules that are applied are uh, the application plans that you have specified in three scale. And the ingress that is used is the ingress that you have provided in your service mesh. So all of those, working seamlessly together for you to, to provide one unified experience on a Red Hat OpenShift platform. OK, so hope uh, you have uh, seen how uh, easily you can uh, you can manage that. Uh, OK, so that was the demo I had. Uh, and uh, let me stop sharing my screen. And uh, I know we have about three minutes left. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, we are happy to answer them. Uh, and let me leave you with, uh, you know, there, there are, uh, if you are interested, actually, there is, uh, uh, there is a particular uh, uh, 
uh, ebook that we have published from Red Hat, uh, which is uh, about uh, you know API management versus service mesh, which talks about uh, this concept and also talks about you know a lot of concepts around uh, how you can architect your uh, microservices and how you can define those boundaries and how you can define your security. And I think that's a really good uh, resource. You'll be able to get that from uh, redhat.com. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's pretty much what I wanted to cover. Uh, Rafael, uh, do you have anything to add? Yeah, thank thank you, Sasha, for Sasha for 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 the rest of this presentation and running demo on the protecting securing APIs. Yeah, so uh, there is this ebook. If you can put on the chat for this session, I think it will be beneficial for for the, the attendees. And 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 there is also the Open API sandbox from Red Hat is available on the Open Accelerators at GitHub. Uh, you can check the code and 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 interact with the whole architecture on how it's described over there. And and yeah, thank you for attending all and enjoy the rest of the the, the conference. If there are any questions. Yeah, thank you for attending and I hope you found it useful. I pasted a link to the ebook here if you want to, uh, you know, check it out. And do, do let us know if you, uh, if you are interested in exploring further with Red Hat. Um, and yeah, uh, enjoy the rest of your API day session. See you, see you next time. Thank you. Awesome.